Well, hello, everyone. This is uh, Kennard Levy Brown speaking. I'm your host for the Merciful Servants of God Biblical Instructional Program on YouTube. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, entering uh, in the realm of Yodeh Vahe, or God's uh, miraculous uh, kingdom spiritually. Uh, this is his dimension. He wants us to come out of the world and come into keeping the Shabbat uh, spiritually. And one day we'll be doing it uh, spiritually and physically or temporally, not temporally, but something that you can see, touch and feel in the future. And so it's been a, another challenging week for me. Um, still having a problem getting sleep. So I'll just be praying that I can get sleep. Uh, but I'm catching up with a lot of things here. And uh, in particular, I'm going to, I'm in the process of designing an effective uh, Facebook ad. I spoke to uh, the people at Facebook to see how I can improve um, the ad that I'm running right now to generate uh, people locally. And they gave me, gave me some good ideas. I'm going to incorporate them as soon as I can and just be praying for the success so that we can grow here locally. Um, we have a good international presence, national presence, but we need to have a good local presence here. So just be praying uh, for that to happen. And uh, I'm sure the coronavirus had a lot to do with that. Uh, but the virus is being tamed right now, mercifully, by Yodi Vahe or God. So um, thank God for that. <laughs> uh, so um, there's still some saber rabbling going on. But as I try to, to explain to people, uh, Yeshua stated in Matthew chapter 24, not to get alarmed by these things. Don't get troubled by it. It's supposed to happen. So, of course, among all the saber rabbling or the, you know, the threatening uh, tones as far as war, there's going to be a natural war. There's no doubt unless there's massive repentance, which unfortunately I don't see. So if the repentance is not coming, then nuclear war is bound to happen, folks. It's guaranteed to happen unless there's some repentance, some kind of coming back to Yode Vahe. And um, I think for the past few programs, I've been explaining this uh, Asbury thing, not to be deceived by it. Uh, uh, I, I believe probably several of the people are sincere, but they're sin sincerely wrong. They're not tapping into God's spirit because if they were, uh, they would be converting over um, almost immediately to wanting to embrace keeping the Sabbath, the holy days and and not eating pork. And uh, in first Kings chapter eight, God stated that he would dwell if they keep the commandments, uh, all the commandments, had a desire to want to keep all the commandments. So Holy Spirit can't dwell when someone resists keeping any of the commandments um, and, and does it purposely. Um, the Holy Spirit is going to have a problem dwelling uh, with that individual. Just like when um, the people of Israel got so wicked that he stopped dwelling in the tabernacle, you know, in, in, in the temple. So that, that can happen. That can happen. So anyway, uh, we got to keep that in mind. And again, for those who don't have a clue about what I'm talking about, you need to get my study article, Spirit of Error versus Spirit of Truth. Um, probably my best article I ever wrote that explains the difference between the Spirit of Error and the Spirit of Truth. There is a difference. First John chapter 4, verse 6 explains that difference. And so uh, we're going to take a look at the Torah portion for today. And let me get my glasses on here and for the remainder of the program. And see who's not too many people who are on the program today for whatever reason. Um, my wife and Sebastian and then I uh, know the other people will probably pop on later on or whatever. So, um, okay, so let's take a look at the tour portions here. Oh, before I do that... Um, I get people coming on here and they, I don't, for whatever reason, they, I don't know, say things um, like um, Yeshua, that's, that's his real name and all that. Okay, so so look, I, I know about this. I've, I've studied Bible. I don't know if you guys know this or not. I took a biblical Hebrew course. I didn't complete it, but I'm in the process of completing it. So I do know a little Hebrew. Um, also, uh, I'm trying to master Hebrew. So I am abreast of it, and um, people that do study Hebrew, they, they would understand what I'm getting ready to say. People that haven't studied Hebrew, uh, you need to go study it, okay? And so I, I got a comment on the chat and about uh, Yeshua's, that's Jesus' real name, okay? 
Number one, folks, who created the different languages? Yode Vahe created the different languages, right? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you type Jesus, um, there's variations of that name, Jesus. It's like if you type Yeshua, there's variations of that name uh, in different languages. Okay, so it, it may be true, and it probably is true, that all languages derive from Hebrew. And really, um, linguists, they state that prior to Hebrew, it was Edenic language, Edenic, meaning from the Garden of Eden. So, so that, but all languages have been derived from that original language, Edenic, including English and and Greek and and and, and other languages. All right, and so I'm, I'm going to show you an article by Dr. Michael Brown, who has a degree in Semitic languages. So <laughs> let's let's take a look at what he has to say about this. And I, I'm just going to. And if you guys need further information about this, I can email. But we got to stop making religion out of, out of God's name. Okay, um, that's not what the religion is all about. Uh, let's take a look here. Um, All right, so this is by Dr. Brown. I'm not related to him as far as I know. And he has a doctorate degree in Semitic languages. Okay, he knows a whole lot more than me about the Hebrew language and Semitic languages. So, you know, I, I refer to people that don't, that uh, know more than me about a specific topic so I can get the facts. All right, so anyway, what is the original Hebrew name for Jesus? And is it true that the name Jesus is really a pagan corruption of the name Zeus? Now, before I read this article, the reason why I use God and Jesus, because most people coming into the true faith, they, that's, the language, that's the language that they understand. Okay, so that's the reason why I use that. You can't come to someone full-blown with saying Yeshua and the rural Kodesh and, and so forth. They're not going to know what you're talking about. It's a different language. And so it's, it's, it still follows the same principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where you, the purpose of teaching, and I am a teacher, by the way. I, I was a Bible teacher before I became a secular teacher, but I'm a Bible teacher, also a secular teacher. I teach economics, computer courses, and I will be teaching marketing courses soon. So I know what I'm talking about as a teacher. So listen up. All right. And so basically, getting back to the situation with Yeshua's name, all right? Uh, states here, um, Dr. Brown states here, I am continually amazed by how many people write to our ministry and ask us questions like, now remember, uh, he's a Jew, by the way, too. He's a Jew, and he has a doctorate degree in Semitic languages. So who do you think is going to know the answer to this, all right? I am continually amazed by how many people write to our ministry and ask us questions like this one, which came in last week. I quote, some Christians say we have to use the Hebrew name Yahshua. They say calling on the name of Jesus is calling on Zeus, that Jesus is a disguise for Satan. What answers do you have for this? Where can we prove the name of Jesus is correct to use in the English translation and pronunciation? All right. So as bizarre as these questions are, the fact that they keep coming up <laughs> and they do they, they keep on coming up unfortunately uh that they, they keep coming up means that they need to be addressed so here are some simple responses for more details see 60 questions christians ask about jewish beliefs and practices question 38 by the way i would recommend dr brown for apologetics apologetics is defending your faith uh, in the area of proving that Yeshua is the Messiah. He is probably the world's renowned expert um, at, at uh, his apologetics in regards to that. All right. But the problem with Dr. Brown is he doesn't believe that Christians don't have to keep the Sabbath and holy days. So that's, that's where I have issues with him at. But as far as uh, his knowledge about the Semitic Hebrew language, as far as his knowledge about proving that the Messiah is Yeshua, he's even successfully debated rabbis, Jewish rabbis. Uh, he has also a good uh, recording that I would recommend you uh, listen to. Is he uh, he debated uh, 
Rabbi Tobia Singer, who I think he has uh, uh, Aaron, uh, um, the line of Aaron blood and so forth. I know he has Levitical priesthood blood, or he may have a blood of the, one or the other. Okay. And he's probably the world's uh, best apologetic in the area of Judaism. And so you have these two experts going back and forth, and I'm not being biased. I'm just being honest. I believe that Dr. Brown uh, certainly uh, defended the faith that Yeshua is the Messiah more so than uh, Tobias Singer tried to defend the fact that Yeshua is not the Messiah because he had more facts than, than Tobias. But anyway, um, the original Hebrew Aramaic name of Jesus is Yeshua. OK, which is short for Yahshua, Joshua, just as Mike is short for Michael. The same Yeshua occurs 27 times in the Hebrew scriptures, prim primarily referring to the high priest. OK, after the Babylonian exile called Yahshua. OK, and more frequently, Yahshua. See Ezra 3 verse 2. So Yahshua's name was not unusual. In fact, as many as five different men had that name in the Old Testament. And this is how the name came to be Jesus in English, simply stated. This is the etymological history of the name Jesus. Hebrew, Aramaic, Yeshua became Greek, Aesis, then Latin, Aesis, passing into German, and then ultimately into English as Jesus. So let's go over this sentence again. This is, this is to educate you here about how we got the name Jesus. So this is the etymological history of the name Jesus. The Hebrew, Aramaic, Yeshua became Greek, Aesus, all right, then Latin uh, Aesus, passing into German and then ultimately into English as Jesus, okay? Why then do some re people refer to Jesus as Yahshua? Let's find out. This is absolutely no support for this pronunciation, not at all, and I say this as someone holding a PhD in Semitic languages. If you guys don't have a clue about that, then you need to study what Semitic languages are. This is what this individual did. He wrote a dissertation based on his major. Okay. Just like I read a dissertation on my major of business administration, but a part of business administration is also marketing. And I, and I wrote a dissertation on diversity in an advertising team. All right. So that's my expertise. Although I have also expertise in the Bible but as of yet, I'm not an expert like Dr. Brown in regards to Semitic languages, but I would say I'm an expert in the Bible, the general message of the Bible. And I think my specialty is understanding uh, that we need to do something that we need to give and share and love everyone, loving your neighbor as yourself. I think I specialize in that. Secondarily, I, I specialize in prophecy, understanding the prophetic books of the Bible as well. And so anyway, getting back to Dr. Brown. My educated guess, and also I'm an expert with all the main basic biblical doctrines, as you are going to discover once I get my book done, <laughs> which I'm trying to get done by Passover. So anyway, my educated guess is that some zillions, but linguistically ignorant people, some zillions, and you can be zillions. There's a scripture in the Bible that you can have a zeal for God, but that can be wrong. It's because you have a zeal for God, just like these people at Asbury. They have a zeal for God, but is it right? Is their worship correct? No, it's not. My educated, my educated guess is that some zealous but linguistically ignorant people thought that Yahweh's name must have been a more over part of our Savior's name, hence Yahshua rather than Yeshua. But again, there is no support of any kind for this theory. The Hebrew Bible has Yeshua. When the Septuagint authors rendered this name in Greek, they rendered it Iesus, I-E-S-O-U-S, Iesus, with no hint of Yah at the beginning of the name. And the same can be said of the Peshitta translators when they rendered Yeshua's name at the Syriac, part of the Aramaic language family. All this is consistent and clear. The original form of the name Jesus is Yeshua, and there is no such name as Yahshua or Yahshua or the like. What about the alleged connection between the name Jesus, Greek, Aesis, and Zeus? This is one of the most ridiculous, let me repeat this, one of the most ridiculous claims that has ever been made, but it is received more circulation in recent years. The internet is an amazing tool of misinformation. And I repeat again two more times. The internet is an amazing tool of misinformation. Again, the internet is an amazing tool of misinformation. If you haven't gone to graduate school or if you haven't had, gotten a doctor degree or you don't need all those things, but getting a doctor degree certainly teaches you how to do 
proper research. Okay. If you don't know how to do proper research, I suggest you, you go to school to learn how to do it, or you can take a course. I can recommend you taking a course on how to do proper research. Because if you don't know how to do proper research, and you're going to find a lot of misinformation on the internet thinking that is true. Incredible. But anyway, uh, this is one of the most ridiculous claims that's ever been made, but it has received more circulation in recent years. The internet is an amazing tool of misinformation. And there are some believers who feel that it is not preferable to use the original Hebrew Aramaic name Yeshua, but that it is wrong to use the name Jesus. Because of this, we will briefly examine this claim and expose the fallacies that underlie it. So listen up. According to the late A.B. Now see, this is someone who has a doctorate degree in Semitic languages. And so this is an example of me using the internet in the right way. I located a credible source. What is a credible source? It's a source that you can rely on. A source has been proven to be very knowledgeable about what you're researching. And so that's what I'm doing right here. All right. You can't just go small blow that just learned it, that you should keep the Sabbath and have been doing it for two years. And then, then he thinks he's a teacher. Um, you can't really rely on that. All right. You, you got to go to credible sources. And so anyway, um, because of this, we will be. OK, so according to the late A.B. training in this holy Bible, I quote, the name of his son, Yahshua, has been substituted by Jesus, Isis and E. Zeus, healing Zeus. All right, so is this credible? Let's take a look. In this one short sentence, two complete myths are stated as fact. First, there is no such name as Yahshua, as we have just explained. And second, there is no connection of any kind between the Greek name Aesus for the name Jesus and the name Zeus. Absolutely none. You might as well argue that Tiger Woods is in the name of a tiger-infested jungle in India as try to connect the name Jesus to the pagan god Zeus. It is that observed, and it is based on serious linguistic ignorance. Ignorance doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you just don't know. Here's another equally observed statement. Observed, observed statement. Basically, to keep it simple, I quote Jesus, I quote, is a very poor Roman translation from Latin that was also poorly translated into Greek, which in no way resembles his Hebrew name, Yahshua. Woo. Get all that. Moreover, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the name Aesis Jesus is a combination of two mythical deities, I-E-U and S-U-S, Zeus, a Greek god. In Gnostic and Greek mythologies, they are actually one and the same pagan deity. So it appears the name Jesus has some documented pagan oranges. That's not good. In fairness, some messianic believers disagree and state that there is no def definitive evidence to connect Jesus to Zeus. However, I disagree with them. The response to this statement, which, which has as much support as the latest Elvis sightings, is quite simple. We know where the name Isis came from, the Jewish Septuagint. In other words, this was not some later pagan corruption of the Savior's name. Rather, it was a natural Greek way of rendering the Hebrew Aramaic name Yeshua at least two centuries before his birth. And is a form of the name found in more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. This is saying something. 5,000 Greek manuscripts. The name Isis, Isis is also found in Greek writings outside the New Testament and dating to that same general time frame. So this is if, if, interesting. See, this is when you go to a credible source, you get credible information. The name Isis is also found in Greek writings outside the New Testament and dating to that same general time frame. Although it is claimed that the Encyclopedia Britannica says that the name Isis, Jesus, is a combination of two mythical deities, I-E-U and S-U-S, Zeus, it actually says no such thing. This is a complete fabrication, intentional or not. In short, as one Jewish believer once stated, Jesus is as much related to Zeus as Moses is to mice. Unfortunately, some popular teachers continue to espouse the Jewish Zeus connection, and many believers follow the pseudo scholarship in these fringe new revelation teachings. Not only are these teachings and practices filled with error, but they do not profit in the least. So to every English speaking believer, I say, do not be ashamed to use the name Jesus. I'm certainly not. I've laid my hands on people in the name of Jesus and they've been healed. That is the proper way to say his name in English, just as Michael is, is the correct English way to say the Hebrew name Machiel and Moses is the, is the correct English way to say the Hebrew name Moshe or Moshe. OK, pray in Jesus name, worship in Jesus and witness in Jesus name. And for those who want to relate to our Messiah's Jewishness, then you're free to do so. Then refer to him by his original name, Yeshua, not Yahshua and not Yahshua. OK. Remember that the, the power of the name is not in its pronunciation, but in the person whom it refers, our Lord and Redeemer and King. So I hope that 
people read this and 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 understand that there's nothing wrong with saying Jesus, Yeshua, Yahshua is some made up name. It has nothing to do with proper Hebrew Semitics. Okay, so let's let's understand that. And I hope and I hope that you've been um, corrected in that area. All right, so uh, let's take a look here at um, the Torah portion today. Let me type it in here. Okay, let's see. Okay, so let's take a look here. All right. Tezefe in a nutshell. All right, so Tezefe, and it's uh, you shall command. So Yodevahe tells Moses, you guys should be able to see this here and the other people that uh, are on, but I don't know, they're not chatting. Okay, and so um, God tells Moses, or Moshe, to receive the children of Israel, pure olive oil to feed the everlasting flame of the menorah, which Aaron is to kindle each day for evening to morning. Now, I'm doing my study on the book of Revelation for those who are interested in attending my Sabbath Bible studies. Um, we need to do it at this time because who knows? There could be a nuclear war happen this year. I don't know. We'll see. But the menorah is, is translated into King James candlesticks. Okay. And the menorah represents an assembly. So it's very interesting how that relates to this passage here. And it says, Yodevahe tells Moshe to receive the children of Israel, to receive from the children of Israel pure olive oil. To feed the everlasting flame of the menorah. Now, the menorah, since it does symbolize an assembly, uh, an assembly should be a menorah, and the children of Israel should have pure olive oil, which is certainly symbolic of, of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, and that Holy Spirit should feed the everlasting flame or spirituality of an assembly, because that's what an assembly represents a menorah, which Aaron is to kindle each day from evening to morning, and so. Uh, just like the the fellowship in the first century in the book of Acts uh, talks about in Acts chapter two and I think also in Acts chapter four that the assembly of the menorah they fellowship with each other every day. Of course, it's difficult to do that now, but that's how close that they were. And I'm telling you, as times get worse, we're going to need to try to fellowship every day, maybe remotely or or in, in person, because we're going to all need each other to keep that everlasting flame or that Holy Spirit burning inside us uh, to his ultimate capacity. So anyway, the priestly garments to be worn by the Kohanim, that's how you say it in Hebrew, priests, while serving in the sanctuary are described. All Kohanim wear, uh, wore the ketonet, a full linen tunic, a mishcha nasaim, linen breeches, a mitz nafet, or mitz ba'at, a linen turban, and a afnet, a long sash oh wound above the waist. I'm going to show you what the priest looks like here in a minute. In addition, the Kohen Gadol, the Kohen Gadol, that's how you pronounce it in Hebrew, high priest. Kohen is priest, Gadol is high. Uh, the ephod, an apron, and I'm going to show you a picture of that here in a minute. An apron-like garment made of blue, purple, and red dyed wool, linen, and gold thread. Number six, the chosin, a breastplate. I'm going to show you that too containing 12 precious stones inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So again, we, you can't get away, and this ministry is never getting, is not going to ever get in the way of telling you the significance of the 12 tribes. Uh, the title of the thumbnail, the thumbnail pictures of this program is what is the significance of the breastplate? I'm going to answer that question today. And so you have 12 precious stones inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Ma'el, a cloak of blue wool with gold bells and decorative pomegranates on his hem. A zit zit, a golden plate on the forehead. A zit, zit rather, a golden plate worn on, it's not a zit zit, but zit, a golden plate worn on the forehead. 
Yeah, the the, the zitz is one of the eight articles worn by the high priest. And it was a golden band worn on the forehead, which was engraved with the words holy to God. Okay. Bearing the inscription holy to God or Kadosh to Yodevah. The Tesava also includes Tesava. That's the, the partial reading for today. Also includes Yodevah's detailed instructions for the seven day initiation of Aaron and his four sons, not Dav, Avehu, Elazar, and Itamar, into the priesthood. And for the making of the golden altar, which which the Ketaret, the incense, was burned. Okay. And so I really like this because it summarizes the Torah portions. And, of course, you feel free to, to go into detail on this site. little disclaimer. They don't believe that Yeshua is in the Messiah. So please look at this uh, from that perspective. Okay. All right. And I am aware I need to talk about Purim or Purim. Uh, Purim will be based on the Jewish calendar, March 6th. So we'll go over that reading on Purim and let the scriptures describe to you why we should celebrate it. All right, so um, let's take a look here. It's a little windy outside, so if you hear that, you'll know why. Okay, the Haftorah portions. So Ezekiel 43, verse 10 to 27. In this week's Chatur, the prophet Ezekiel describes a vision of the altar that would be built for the third holy temple and its dedication. Although the scriptures uh, highlighting Ezekiel 40 to 48 is the reconstruction of the third temple <laughs> after it's partially destroyed uh, before the Messiah comes back. So anyway, uh, the prophet Ezekiel describes a vision of the altar that would be built for the third holy temple and its dedication ceremony paralleling this week's Torah portion which discusses the dedication of the, the tabernacles altar, okay, which is the Hanukkah, okay, it means dedication of the altar. Shortly after the destruction of the first temple, Ezekiel experienced, and that's where we get Hanukkah from, Ezekiel experienced a vision of the third holy temple or the fourth holy temple, I guess, or the reconstruction of the third temple that would be built by the Messiah. Yodevah tells Ezekiel to recount to the Jewish people, this vision, and this hopefully will bring them, or the 12 tribes of Israel, will bring them to be ashamed of the deeds they did caused by the destruction of the temple. I quote, and if they are ashamed of all that they have done, let them know the, the form of the house and its scheme, its exits and its entrances, and all its forms and all its laws, or Torahs and all its teachings. Ezekiel then goes on to describe in detail the reconstructed temple, uh, temple's altar, and also describes a seven-day inauguration ceremony and the offerings, which will be brought on each day of that special week. So the temple is very important. I did a Bible study on the temple for those who are listening to me for the first time last week. So it's on our YouTube channel. Go ahead and, and listen to that. Uh, the task called the Tabernacle of God. So it's very important to understand those things. All right. So let me uh, do a short little study on Purim and, and, and why the Jews celebrate Purim. Um, let me get my Bible out here and I'll go over that here because it's going to be done next, um, this coming Monday. Okay, so let's take a look at this and let's go to Esther. So this is, I'm just going to read 8 and 9 here. It says, uh, Esther saves the Jews. So on that day, our God, uh, God saved the Jews through her. Some King Asarerus gave, on that day, did the King Asarerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther, the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had, was told what he was, what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, uh, who was part of the Amalekites and gave it to Mordecai and, and Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman and Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite who was part of the Amalekites. Yep. Uh, the descendant of Agag, which we, we understand to be Gog and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king had held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther rose and stood before the king. And boy, you know, this is a good example, again, of wives should respect their husbands in this way. And, 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 and said, if it pleased the king, 
and if I had found favor in his sight, and the thing seemed right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come upon my people? And how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king Asherah said unto Esther, the queen of Mordecai, the queen, and I'm sorry, not the queen of Mordecai, but the queen, and to the queen and to Mordecai, the Jew, behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman and him they have hanged upon the gallows because he had his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it like of you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month of Savan, uh, on the on the twenty third thereof, as it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces, which from India unto Ethiopia, a hundred and twenty seven provinces unto the province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language, and he wrote in the king Azarera's name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by post on horseback and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, little ones and women, and to take spoil for them for prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of King Azarera's upon the 20 uh 20th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, the cop copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all the people and that the Jews should be ready against themselves against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out being hastened and pressed by the king's commandment. And the decree was given at Shushan, the palace. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king and royal apparel blue and white and of great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoice and be glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor in every province and in every city. Whatsoever the king's command and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. And this is what I want you to see here. People that don't understand that God's religion is for everybody, but you don't have to become a Jew, but that's what they chose to do right here. And many of the people of the land became Jews. All right, so that's why Yeshua came on the earth to explain that. Someone does not have to become a Jew to keep Torah. And you got some false religions going around preaching that, that that's the case, and that's not the case. If you believe that, you're denying the New Testament. You're denying for one of the reasons why Yeshua came. Is to say, hey, I'm an equal opportunity God. I want variety, and someone doesn't have to become a Jew to worship me. So anyway, that's what the New Testament is really. That's one of the main messages of the New Testament. So anyway, Esther 9, verse 9, 9 verse 1. And in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put to execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, although though it was, wait a minute, in a day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king as their heirs to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them for the fear of them fell upon all the people and all the rulers in the provinces. Let me uh, check and make sure you guys. OK, you see the scriptures there. All right. OK, all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon him. For Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame went out throughout all the provinces for this man, Mordecai, waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. And in Shushan, uh, Shushan the palace of Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. And Parshantatha and Dolphin and Asapa, Paratha and Adalia and Aradatha and Parmashta and Arasa and Aradah and Bejasatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of 
Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on the spoil lay they not their hand. On that day, the number of those that were slain in Shushan, the palace of uh, Shushan, was brought before the king. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the palace, and the ten sons of Haman, what they have done in the rest of the king's provinces. Now, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee, or what is thy request further? And it shall be done. Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Sushan to do tomorrow also according to this day decree and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan and they hang Haman's ten sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered, gathered themselves together on the 14th day also in the month of Adar and slew 300 men at Shushan but on the prey they laid not their hand. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes 75,000, but they laid not their hands on the prey. On the 13th day of the month of Zara, on the 14th day of the same rested day, they made it a day of feasting and gladness. So this is the origin of Purim, okay, or Purim. But the Jews that, which means lots, but the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day there on the 14th and on the 14th day there and on the 15th day on the same day they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness therefore the jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month of adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions to one another so this is what you're supposed to do on purim the biblical instruction you suppose it's, it's like a it's a minor holiday there's no uh, indication that it's a Shabbat, but it's a minor holiday. And what Jews uh, traditionally do, they read the entire book of Esther. There's only, I think, 10 chapters. And they, and they read it. Um, and then they reflect on what happened. And then they uh, you have a joyous, feastful occasion. And then you uh, give gifts to one another. There's nothing wrong with doing this. This is right in the Bible. And Yeshua, whether people want to realize it or not, did the same thing. It's in the scriptures. And, and a good day and of sending, because he was a Jew, and of sending portions one to another. So it should be a joyful day of giving to one another. And I don't know, I don't know if people really celebrate it that way, but that's the way the Bible tells us we need to celebrate Purim. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king as their heirs near and far to establish it, this among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of the, of the same year as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies in the month which was turned into them uh, from sorrow to joy. And from morning unto a good day that they should make a, them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions. This is how you celebrate it. Sure, there's Jewish tradition, but we need to look at if the Bible gives us instructions on how to celebrate a particular day, we need to, to, to look into it and emulate it. Because Yeshua certainly did exactly what is instructed here. So that they should, so here's the instruction, biblical instruction how to keep, keep Purim. That they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending portions to one another. And don't forget about the poor. So on, on Purim, you should be thinking about the poor and, and sending gifts to the poor. You could go to feedingamerica.com, give $10, $20. I mean, that, that's fulfilling Purim. Uh, you can send portions or gifts to one another. Uh, if you like, you can send gifts to this ministry, and we would appreciate it very much. Um, and also uh, feast and have a joyful time because the reason why it's a joyful time is because Yodivahe miraculously intervened and saved the Jews from what Haman did. So that's the reason why it's a joyous occasion. So, and the Jews undertook to do as they had begun and as Mordecai had written unto them because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which is... Um, an Amalekite, Gog, a Gog, which is a Gog, the enemy of all the Jews had devised against the Jews to destroy them and a cast pure, that is Lot, that's what it means, Lot, uh, to consume them and to destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head and that he and his sons be hanged on, his, on the gallows, where they called these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore, for all the words of this letter and of that which 
they had seen concerning the matter and which uh, had come unto them. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them. In other words, they wanted to worship the way they would worship, uh, as long as it's based on the Bible, them so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. That's the reason why. And that's why you get some people out of their ignorance and maybe, I don't know, I don't know if it's stupidity, but it's certainly ignorance. That they say, well, Jesus didn't celebrate Purim. Yes, he did, because this is what the decree. God inspired them for every Jew to celebrate Purim every year. This is a, a strong tradition that Yeshua followed. So, and these days should be, and I and I teach it as a strong day, along with Hanukkah and or Hanukkah. People pronounce it. I like to pronounce it in his original Hebrew vernacular, which is Hanukkah, and then Purim. Some some people pronounce it Purim. All right. Uh, and these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family and every province and every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews. OK. This was inspired by God. Nor the memorial. OK, so that these days, this is in, this is in the word of God, folks. These days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews. And they have not. No other memorial of them perish from their seat, and they have not. Okay. And God welcomes anyone who joins himself to the Jews to celebrate. If you want to celebrate, like you, he, he, he welcomes that. But of course, we're supposed to follow Yeshua's example. He certainly celebrated Purim or Purim, and we should do the same. So the, the then Esther, the queen, the daughter of Ab Abihel, and Mordecai, the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm. This second letter of Purim, they got this authority from God to confirm this. And he sent the letters into all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Assyrius with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim in their times appointed. According as um, at his appointed occasion, okay? According as Mordecai, the Jew, and Esther, the queen, had enjoined them. And as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed. So when you worship Yeshua Messiah, you are joining a Jew. You are being attached to a Jew, folks, when you do that. So if you're going to attach yourself to the Jews, you need to do what the Jews have done. Okay? And you need to do what the most popular and most righteous Jew is still doing, celebrating Purim. And I'm sure he's doing that along with the Father up in heaven. They will be celebrating Purim. Uh, verse 32, and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. And it talks about the greatness of Azarias, uh, of Mordecai, and the king Azarias laid a tribute upon the land. That's all they ever do. Nations tax, 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 <laughs> and upon the isles of the sea. And all the acts of his power and of his might and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, where the king advanced him and are they not written in the chronicles and the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai, the Jew, next unto King Azarias, is so similar to what happened to Joseph. Remember, Joseph was second in command of Pharaoh, where Mordecai was second in command of King Azarias. And great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all. I love this at the end. And great among, so uh, Queen, uh, King Mordecai was great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people. So he sought the welfare or the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. So I don't know if this is ever taught about Purim, but in the context of Purim, we should be seeking wealth. And what is this Hebrew word here? Let's take a look at this. So this is Tav in Hebrew. So the wealth, this word should have been translated the good, the good of the people, okay? The good to the sight of the people, to the taste, to the smell, all right? So the welfare, so in the context of Purim, Purim is a day where we should be seeking the good of the people of God, wherever they're at, and to speak shalom or peace to all those who are Jews are those who attach themselves to Jews. And of course, if you truly call yourself a believer, 
When I mean by attached to Jew, I don't mean becoming a Jew, but realizing that Yeshua is a Jew and he's the king of Israel and he's going to follow the Torah and we need to attach ourselves to him and to keep the law that the king of Israel uh, admonishes. That's what we need to do. But Purim is all about that. And I don't I don't really hear that preached about that part about Purim as far as uh, uh, seeking the good of, of all of God's people, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. Um, and 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 seek to give to the poor, all right, and, and have a, a festive, joyous occasion, remembering that God will deliver you out of any trial. All you need to do is put him first in your life. That is the message of Purim that I hope that people understand. Okay, so that was our little short Bible study on Purim. And um, let's take a look at some world events here. But we can go to Hebrews here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Yeah, so this is this has the temple. Uh, the temple language here, Hebrews chapter 10, 13, verse 10. And so in that passage of scripture, you we have an altar where they have no right to eat, which serve, which they have no right to eat, which serve the the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp or outside the camp where Jesus or Yeshua also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood and allow it without the gate. Let us go forth therefore into without the camp uh, bearing his reproach. So let's understand what this is talking about here. Let's get a little background here. All right, so the sin offering. The offering invokes at least five images here. First, The first image we have is the sin offering. Yeshua suffered death, and this had the significance of a sin offering in two ways. First, just as the Kohen Gadol, or the high priest, brings the blood of the animals to the holy place, so Yeshua suffered a death in order to make the people holy through his own blood. Second, just as the bodies of the animals used for a sin offering are burned outside the camp, so Yeshua's death took place outside the gate of the city of Yahuzalim, uh, Yuzalim, okay, which replaced the camp in the wilderness. Yuzalim, all right, that's how you say it in Hebrew, which replaced the camp in the wilderness. See, Mishnah, Sanhedrin, 6, verse 4, quoted uh, Acts 7, verse 58. Impurity. Just as the lepers and other people declared impure had to remain outside the camp in disgrace, so Yeshua was wrongfully regarded as impure and suffered death with disgrace by being executed as a criminal on the stake outside the gate of Gagata. Separation. Being outside the camp in disgrace implies not only impurity, but separation from uh, the Jewish people. Yeshua is indeed separated. However, his separation is in fact not from the Jewish people due to his impurity, but unto God due to holiness so that his separation from the Jewish people is wrongful, or we can say that the 12 tribes of Israel, illusionary and not disgraceful. Because um, the Jewish people is the tribe of Judah. They're just one small part of the 12 tribes of Israel. Moreover, he can make uh, all the 12 tribes of Israel holy through his own blood, ending their very real and justified separation from God due to sin. So anyway, just wanted to go over that here. And then it talks about the red heifer, the reference to Yeshua making his people holy through his own blood, which mentions the red heifer. The body of the red heifer, too, was burned outside the camp. And in a permanent city, having mentioned the gate of the city, the author returns to the language of Hebrews 11, verse 9 to 10, Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16, Hebrews 12, verse 22, and reminding us, believers, that we have no permanent city here, but seek the one to come, the heavenly Jerusalem or Jerusalem. There is no implication of otherworldliness in the sense of neglecting the needs of this world. Rather, we simultaneously in both the Olam Hazah and the Olam Haba. All right. So anyway, that should give you a little background there. Let us go forth unto without the camp, bearing his reproach for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come, the heavenly Jerusalem. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And I want to read this in the complete Jewish Bible version. It's a better translation of this verse right here. But don't forget doing and sharing with others. And that certainly is in line with Purim today, right? 
with support theorem symbolizes doing good to others and preaching about peace. That's what we should be doing. Shalom. What does it say? Let's go back to that verse, last verse in Esther here. Right here. We should be seeking the good of all the people and intercede for the welfare. And that's a better translated welfare of all their descendants. And that's what we should be doing. Um, and then, of course, getting back to this scripture here. In verse um, the purpose of the sacrifices, we should be doing sacrificing for each other and, and don't forget to do good and to share with others for. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So, so Purim has everything to do with that, ladies and gentlemen. And I just, we got to stick to the Bible. The Bible gives us indication on how to celebrate even traditional days. When we need to go by the Bible first, there's nothing wrong with any of the uh, Purim traditional items that are that are, that are added that's been added since the after the Second Temple period, if it doesn't violate the Scriptures. Okay. All right, so. Let me see if there's anyone else. Uh, we got three people. I don't know. I don't see any indication at all that that's, you know, if you want to dress up in costumes and play Haman, I don't see any problem with that, but it's not in the Bible, you know, so. Um, but if you, I, I know it's nothing wrong with having a play. Uh, I've seen little cute plays uh, with the Purim um, to drive home a point and, and help the kids understand what's going on. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. Because it's not deceitful if they're going by the scriptures and what it's saying. So, but God allows you some creativity in that area as long as it doesn't violate scripture. Okay, so let's take a look at world news and then I'm going to sign off here. I'm tired. I got things to do. And, um, oops, see myself here. Let me get off here. There we go. All right, so yeah, I wanted to go over these other articles here real quick if I can. Okay, so let's take a look at the ephod. Okay, the ephod. Um, let me pull this up here. And for those who celebrate Purim, happy Purim. We, we will be celebrating it. We'll, you know, focus on it and what it all means on Monday evening, March 6th. So you guys should be able to see that here. Yeah, excuse that. That's my, uh, I'm a writer and I have to get citations from time to time. And so I have a program that helps me get that. So just ignore that. But anyway, um, an ephod was a type of apron, which according to the Hebrew Bible was worn by the Jewish high priest, the Kohen Kadosh. So here it is right here. It's, it's in the yellow here. Let me show it to you. The Jewish high priest wearing the sacred, the ephod right here. That's the breastplate. The breastplate was attached to the ephod. And that's the ephod right here. The ephod is depicted here in yellow. So you should see, see right there. This is the ephod right here. And this is the uh, breastplate. All right. So it was it was uh, connected with oracular practices and priestly ritual. All right. So and it has um, here the scriptural references here of the ephod. Now let's go to the priestly breastplate. The priestly breastplate. All right, so the priestly breastplate or the breast piece of judgment. Okay, we're going to get into what that is here in a minute. Um, make sure you guys can see it. Okay. So there you go. This is what it looks like here. And, you know, I have my uh, thumbnail here uh, today. It has a picture of this. Okay, this is what the breastplate looked like. It was attached to the ephod, which was yellow. All right, so the priestly breastplate uh, or the breast piece of judgment was a sacred breastplate worn by the high priest of the Israelites, according to the book of Exodus. In the biblical account, the breastplate is termed the breastplate of judgment, okay, because of the Urim and Thummim were placed upon it. So what was the, what was that? What was the Urim? Let's take a look here. 
All right. The Aram, Arim, and Athaman, which means, Yarim uh, means lights, and Athaman means uh, perfections, okay? Are elements of the Hashin, the breastplate worn by the high priest attached to the ephod. They are connected, okay? With the claromancy, the divination by casting lots. Most scholars suspect that the phrase refers to a set of two objects used by the high priest to answer a question or reveal the will of God. All right, so they first appear in Exodus 28, verse 30, where they are named for the inclusion on the breastplate. And so, so uh, they would communicate with God with the Urim and Thummim, all right, to answer a question, and, and God would light up uh, one of the stones. Um, that that's what I've uh, been taught to understand, all right. In, in response to a question that was asked. So, I'm trying to read here, if it says that here. But it was it was used. Okay, it says right here. Similarly, where non-prophets portrayed as asking God for guidance and advice, and not describe what the medium implied. Okay, the question is, be it the author of the passage, nevertheless. So it says the Urim and Thummim were put inside the palace, were presumably small and fairly flat, were possibly tablets of wood or bone. So according to classical rabbinical literature, in order for the Urim and Thummim to give an answer, it was first necessary for the individual to stand facing a fully dressed high priest, priest rather, and vocalize the question briefly in a simple way, though it was not ne necessary for it to be loud enough for anyone to hear it. Maimonides explains that the high priest would stand facing the Ark of the Covenant with the inquirer behind him facing the priest back. After the inquirer asked the question, the Holy Spirit would immediately overcome the priest and he would see the letters protruding in the prophetic vision. So this is what they're saying. We don't know if this is exactly true, but you know, I don't think I need to read the rest of it. But anyway, that, that's just theory there. But anyway, and so let's read. Let me go back here. So that's what the Jews think it is. But let's, let's take a look at what the Bible talks says about it here. Because that's what I'm more interested in, what the Bible says about something. So um, let's take a look here. Okay, so let's go back to Exodus 27. And get the oil for the lamp. And the priest garments here. Let me read this in the King James for a little clarity sake here. And he says, And take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithmar and Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments. You just saw what the garments are. For Aaron, thy brother, for glory and beauty, and thou shalt speak unto all that are wise. So this tells you that when you're in God's presence, you should try to dress your best. This is an example of it right here. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And, and these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate, you just saw the breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a broad coat, and a mitre. So they, the priest did wear hats, okay, and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, of, of blue and of purple, scarlet and fine twine linen with cunning work. And it shall have the two shoulder pieces there of edge at the two edges there, so it shall be joined together in the curious girdle. Uh, of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work there even of gold blue and purple and scarlet and fine twin linen and thou shalt take two ox stones and grave on them the names of the children of israel six of the uh, of their names on one stone and 
the other six names on the rest and the other son according to their birth with the work of an engraver and stone engravings of a signet shall thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of israel thou shalt make them to be set in the ouches of gold and thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for the stones of memorial and to the children of israel the stones of memorial and the children of israel so that's what they represent and aaron shall bear their names before the lord upon his two show because he was the high priest at that time for a memorial and thou shalt take ouches of gold and two chains of the pure gold at the ends of wreathen work shall thou make them and fasten the wreathen chains of ouches and thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment the cunning work after the work of the ephod thou shalt make it gold blue purple scarlet and the fine twin linen and thou shalt make it four squares shall be double the span shall be the length there and the span shall be the breadth there thou shalt set it in the settings of stones even four rows of stones. First row shall be sardis, a topaz, and carbuncle. This shall be the first row, and the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and the third row, a lingar, and an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an ox, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names. Here we go. The stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel. Twelve, according to their names, the engravings of the signet, Everyone with his name shall be according to the 12 tribes. You tell me the 12 tribes aren't significant to God. Yes, they are. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of the wreathing work a pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two wreathing chains of gold and the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate and the, and the two rings, whatever. Right? So we keep on going about that and so i just wanted to and then right here and it says and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the urim the urim and the thummim and they shall be upon aaron's heart when he goes before the lord so when whenever the high priest went before the lord the lord saw israel on aaron's chest all right uh symbolized by the breastplate and aaron heart and so they shall be upon aaron's heart when he go up before the lord and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel and upon his heart before the Lord continues. So that is very significant there. So the significance of the breastplate is that God uh, holds Israel very important to him as far as um, being the leaders of this world. They should be anyway. And, and, uh, Again, I've showed the scripture to people several times lately, but Matthew chapter 29, let's take a look at 19 rather. Matthew chapter 19. Starting at verse 28. And Yeshua, or Jesus, said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel so that's how significant the 12 tribes of israel are that's the reason why we need to know and this ministry has the true knowledge of who those tribes are all right and that's one of our missions is to educate people on the tribes all right and so they're going to be judging the 12 tribes of israel and then in the book of revelation which i'm going over now again you take a look at revelation chapter 21 So the new Jerusalem. And in verse 12, it states here and had a wall. So this is the new Jerusalem had a wall great and high and it had 12 gates, 12 gates to the wall. And at the gates, 12 angels and names written there, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. OK, and so they're going to be named on the gates, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then uh, the apostles, because they have something to do with the 12 tribes of Israel. And verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles. Okay. So this, this is awesome. This is awesome. An awesome message. Okay, see if there's any questions. No. 
All right, so I hope people are staying awake. Let's go to uh, some information that may wake you up. If you're still asleep, let's take a look at the economic collapse blog. Okay. States here. Why is every Walmart in the entire city of Portland, and then Portland's a, a city located in Oregon, the state of Oregon, being permanently shut down? Why? By the end of the month, there will be no more Walmart stores, no more Walmart stores in Portland. More than 641,000 people live in the cities of Portland, so you should so you would think that there should be a lot of money to be made there, but Walmart has decided to wave the white flag. Portland has been transformed into a complete and other hellhole, <laughs> and hell uh, means grave, okay? Um, and, and apparently Walmart executives have determined that things are not going to turn around anytime soon. So they have announced that the last two Walmart stores in Portland that were still operational will be permanently shut down. And so the number of beef cows in the United States drops to the lowest level since 1962 as the global crisis intensifies. Okay, folks, you know, this ministry, one of our responsibilities is to wake you up to reality. And that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so Americans need to be prepared. And that's what my, I prepared my family for this stuff. You guys need to be doing the same. Americans need to be prepared to eat a lot less beef because the size of the national cattle herd is steadily shrinking. And of course, this is happening in the context of a much larger crisis. As I detailed in the previous article, even CNN is admitting that we are currently in the midst of the worst food crisis in modern history. The worst, let me highlight this. CNN is admitting that what? That we are currently in the midst of the worst food crisis in modern history, the worst food crisis. Even though children are literally dropping dead from starvation on the, on the other side of the planet, a lot of people here in the United States refuse to take this crisis seriously. As long as their stomachs, and, and God prophesied our stomachs are big, uh, Jezreel wax fat, Jezreel wax fat, right? In Deuteronomy 32, our stomachs are real fat, aren't they? As long as their stomachs are full, they think everything is just fine. But the truth is that conditions are also starting to get tight here in the United States. Bankruptcies absolutely soar as America's absurd debt bubble begins to implode. Imploding means destroyed from, from within, from the inner environment. And so, I am so alarmed by the economic numbers that have been coming out recently. I wrote about some of them in an article that I posted yesterday, and I'm going to write about some of them today. Ever since the end of the Great Recession, Americans have been piling up debt at a staggering pace. And, I, you know, I'm trying to get out of debt right now, and hopefully I'll be able to get out of debt. Shoot, I'm hoping by the end of this year. Americans have been piling up debt at a staggering pace, and now that debt bubble is starting to implode. There isn't really a precedent for this, and so we can't look back at past events in order to protect, or project rather, what will happen next. But it should be obvious to all of us that things will soon start getting really bad in this country. Brace yourself for extreme economic turbulence. Why is the U.S. economy suddenly deteriorating so rapidly all around us? Well, the short answer is that the downturn is way overdue. For years, our leaders tried to cheat the laws of economics. The Federal Reserve pushed interest rates all the way to the floor, which is something that never would happen in a true free market economy. And they pumped tra trillions of fresh dollars that they literally created out of thin air and that's what that is when you when you print out money, you know, there are money machines, the money money supply increases, and then eventually uh, in the in the long term that it'll, it'll cause inflation to increase. Meanwhile, our politicians in Washington were engaging in the greatest debt binge that the world has ever seen. All the reckless manipulation seemed to work for a while, but many of us warned that it would be inevitably that would inevitably create a major inflation crisis. And this is precisely what has happened. So now the Fed is aggressively hiking interest rates in a desperate attempt to tame the inflation monster that they've helped create 
and higher rates are absolutely crushing economic activity. Inflation is simply uh, prices going up. And this is interesting. A 1998 Ford Escort for $289 a month for 84 months. Inflation is completely destroying, just like the Bible prophesied with the third seal in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6. That's what's happening. It's completely destroying our standard of living. Inflation is a hidden tax on all of us. And unfortunately, most Americans don't understand this. Most of them cheered when the federal government was handing out free checks as if it were candy. <laughs> and, and most Americans fully approved of the Federal Reserve propping up our financial markets by flooding the system with obscene amounts of money. But that, that's the that's increasing the money supply. And if you do that, then inflation will eventually increase in the long term. But now we are paying the price. Our money doesn't go nearly as far as it once did, and the cost of living has become extremely oppressive. So anyway, folks, you know, we need to, the handwriting's on the wall. We need to get prepared uh, for the worst and hope for the best, as I've tried to explain each and every time I have this program. Here's a website you need to go to. Be prepared. And stock up on emergency food now, folks. Don't wait until this stuff happens, okay? You need to start stocking up on emergency food now. You need to start doing it because you're not going to be able to do this once all this stuff goes down. So you got to get like Noah. Noah prepared his family. He was warned ahead of time. This ministry is warning you ahead of time of what's going to happen. Don't get lazy. Wake up. And prepare yourself for the worst and hope for the best. So I hope you heard that. Oops, wait a minute. Let me go to this website. Here we go. Oh, you should be able to see that. I was talking about something else, this article, and uh, I don't know if you guys even saw that. I guess you did. I don't know. Uh, let me know if you guys saw this, uh, saw these articles that I was reading. Let me know in the comments. Did you see the articles? Anybody awake? Did you did you see the articles that I was uh, showing? Can anybody tell me? All right, nobody's paying attention. Okay, so anyway, um, these are several articles that I, I was referring to here. The um, why is every Walmart in the entire city of Portland being permanently shut down? And then number of beef cows in the U.S. drops to the lowest level. Uh, bankruptcies absolutely soars. America's observed debt bubble begins to implode. And then brace yourself for extreme economic turbulence. Then the 1998 Ford Escort for $289 a month for 84 months. Inflation is completely destroying our standard of living. I'm telling you, folks, I guess you want to get bombed to paying attention because that's what's going to happen. Uh, you get bombed, and then when, when your your hands fall off, and your eyes fall off, and your ears, and then you say, "Oh, I should have listened to Canard. I should have listened to this other individual that was preaching right." But anyway, um, let me get back here. This is emergency uh, emergency essentials. Okay, and you should go to this website to purchase what you need to survive, folks. All right, so I'm getting ready to get off here. I got things to do. I got to get some rest here, and I hope you enjoyed my effort here at, at trying to teach you guys words here. And so um, let me go ahead and say the blessing, and I'll be done here. Uh, Priestly blessing, Berkat Kohanim, Yevavarekat Adonai Yishmareka. May God bless and safeguard you. Yev Adonai Panav Ileka Vi Chaneka. May God show kindness and be gracious to you. Yisha Adonai Panach Ileka V'yashem Lacha Shalom. May God turn his countenance to you and establish peace for you. And I, I'm going to warn, give you a warning here. You know, Noah preached to many people in the world. And only seven people believed him. All right. And so Yeshua stated in Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 26, that uh, the set time of his second coming will be similar to Noah. As I tried to explain to this other person that's wrapped up in this Asbury speaking tongue stuff, 
uh, emotionalism. It's not a popularity contest, folks. It's a quality contest right now. Matthew 7, verse 14 plainly states, very few people embrace this way of life in this evil age of Satan. But, you know, when Yeshua comes back or even before it and during the tribulation, people will get, quote, spanked into it. The spanking, of course, is a tribulation and nuclear bombs and other kind of things. But you have a chance not to have to, to go through a nuclear holocaust unprotected. You have a chance to be miraculously protected if you just adhere to this ministry and, and what we're teaching out of the Bible. But that's entirely up to you. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, may Yah bless and keep you. And my wife will be available for the women next week. And I'll be available tomorrow uh, in the Columbus, Ohio area uh, where we fellowship at. And um, I'm going to be giving a Bible study uh, tomorrow. Uh, it'll be remote for those who aren't in the area. And then it'll be uh, face to face for those who choose one to 10 um, in the area. With that, may y'all bless and keep you. And y'all willing, I'll be available to you uh, tomorrow and uh, next Friday. Shabbat Shalom.